Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful spring morning, right? A little on the chilly side. Sometimes I'm, or the, lately these days, especially when I go walking in the morning, I'm beginning to wonder if we're actually going into spring or into fall. <laughs> um, but God is good. God blesses us. He gives us beautiful weather. He gives us the sun. He even gives us the rain, which is imperative, right? We need that for growth. Um, and we also need the Lord. Because without him, we don't have a hope. We don't have an eternal future, which is the gift that he's offered for every one of us that choose to follow him. And we know that that happens because of the mercy that he shows us. So for his honor and glory, depth of mercy. Depth of mercy can there be mercy still reserved for me can my God his wrath forbear me the chief of a sinner's spare and find me on my knees hear my soul depth of mercy can there be mercy still reserved for me Happy Sabbath, church family. Good to be in the house of the Lord with you all today again, especially after a long week 
And we just praise God for his mercies and for his goodness. I want to start by first wishing my wife, who just sang, a happy Mother's Day, and her mother a happy Mother's Day. Um, we appreciate, I appreciate all that they both do, um, and that all the mothers do. Um, mothers are the first place of safety we find in this world. Um, and it is one of the reasons um, the enemy will often attack even our mothers. And I've heard many women tell me that it was motherhood that drew them closer to God. It was motherhood that drew them closer to God. And I don't know if that meant they had, you know, like my mother, bad children. Um, <laughs> but, or if it just means that you learn you can't control everything for your child. And that you've got to stay on your knees and expect that God will protect your child when you can't. That drives all parents, but I would have to say especially mothers, um, to their knees to really be able to call on God. All right. This is mirroring backwards. Plug it up, plug it back in. Usually doesn't do this. I don't know why it's backwards today. morning we had like three cars pull out in front of us on our way here like everything that could go wrong was going wrong so maybe the devil doesn't want this message preach I'm not sure um I guess so we're gonna preach it anyway all right so our scripture reading it was read so well by Donnie is first John 4 and verse 18 first John 4 and verse 18 there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Our message, our message this Sabbath is entitled, Facing Your Fears. Facing Your Fears. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, I ask once again that you just make me a nail on the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. Upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard, Lord. Instead, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. When we left off uh, a month ago, last time I spoke, we... Elijah had just called fire down from heaven. The prophets of Baal had been slaughtered, and he and Ahab ran as the sound of rain drew close. At that time, Elijah was riding on a spiritual high. You know that feeling after that week of prayer when you've recommitted your life to Christ and, and you think God is now going to make everything easy and simple. That experience you have when, when, you, when, you, when you've been in the church a long time and assume that calamity is beyond your reach. Elijah, as he is running with Ahab, uh, the spirit of prophecy tells us he believes that because of the miracle that has been worked and the destruction of the prophets of Baal, that not just Ahab, but also his wife Jezebel would come to know God Elijah expected a great reformation in Israel because of what happened on Mount Carmel. He was expecting everything to shift after years of idolatry and rebellion. Elijah thought his work was done and that he would finally be able to move on and Israel would be preserved. In the book of 1 Kings 19 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel, 
Those four words are pretty powerful. And Ahab told it, you know, you could just read past this and miss the significance. Ahab was not the priest of his home. He was subservient in his home. And what I mean by that is, he didn't go back to Jezebel and say, Elijah has done a great thing. Uh, we are going to have reformation. He goes back and like a, like a tattletale. He goes and, and, and whines to Jezebel about what is done. The scripture says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now to tell you who was the boss in this house, verse 2 says, Jezebel sent a messenger to El unto Elijah. Now remember, Ahab and Elijah had just been together not that long ago. Ahab didn't say anything negative to Elijah. But when Jezebel finds out, she sends a messenger to Elijah, who at this point has his guard down thinking the whole kingdom is about to change. The message says this, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, speaking of the prophets of Baal, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now let me say it like this. Excuse my street colloquialism, but Jezebel was gangster. Jezebel was straight ruthless. She was ready to kill Elijah, and she was not afraid to actually tell him she was coming for him. She, in fact, she gives him less than 24 hours to live. When Elijah gets the message in verse 3, the Bible says he arose and went for his life. He believed Jezebel more than the promises of God. Y'all missing this thing. When Elijah hears that she has put a, basically a bounty on his head, that she is coming to kill him, Elijah does not wait to figure out what's going on. He packs up and runs. The Bible says he came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. He left the country. That's like running and, and running to Mexico. He, he got out. He was so scared that when he gets to Beersheba, he leaves his servant there. <laughs> Elijah had the mentality that, that if she's coming, maybe she'd, maybe she'd get to the servant and they'd, 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 they'd mess with the servant and leave him alone. It's like they say, when I, when I, went, to the mountain, I went to the mountains in California and at one of our Adventist camps and they have these signs about the bears and showed a picture how the bear rips the car top open. And I took all these kids from the inner city, and they saw that everybody was scared to death. And one, one kid said, listen, if the bear comes, I don't have to be, I don't have to be fast. I just got to be faster than all of you. <laughs> he leaves his servant there. And verse 4, but he himself, look at this church, he went a day's journey, the time that she gave him for his life, Elijah does not stop moving. He goes a day's journey into the wilderness. The Bible says that he comes to a juniper tree, he sits down under it, and he stops there. Now, the, the interesting thing about the juniper tree is that it's not a very tall tree. It grows only to about seven feet high, but snakes can't stand juniper trees. So if you... <laughs> If you sleep under a juniper tree, you can sleep without the worry in the wilderness that the snakes are going to get you. Elijah's my kind of guy because I don't like snakes either. But the Bible says that he requested for himself that he might what? That he might die. I want you to get this, church. This is one of the most unique statements in the scripture that someone, a prophet, who had just worked the miracle of calling fire from heaven, fire that didn't just burn up 
what was on the altar. It burnt up the stone. The Bible says it lapped up the water in the trench around the altar. This kind of Holy Ghost supernatural power had been witnessed by Elijah not much more than a day earlier. Yet now he prays to God that he would die. What a turn of events. He said, it is, better, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. One of the biggest mistakes we make as Christians, as people in general, but as Christians, is that we compare ourselves with others. As Elijah sat under this juniper tree, all alone, he started to look back on his ministry and he said, it's enough. I, I, I couldn't do what I was tasked to do. No great revival has come. Jezebel is still in power. In fact, she's after my life. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. He says, because I'm not better than my father's. He thought he could do what others could not do. And Elijah decided in a sense, but he was alone before he was actually alone. He had made up in his mind that he was so unique, so different, that his problems were so special compared to everyone else's that Elijah was alone before he was alone. In fact, this is what he says in 1 Kings 18, 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are, are 450 men. He had made up in his mind that he was alone. He thought he was the only one still standing for God. And because of this, he became isolated, not in terms of geography or population. Elijah became isolated emotionally. When you think you have to stand up against the world all by yourself, when you do not realize that as a Christian, you are part of a family of people who are fighting the good fight of faith and, and working for the uplift of the kingdom of the living God, when you begin to think you're all alone and no one feels what you feel. As the old Negro spiritual says, Elijah sat there and he sang, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I've been at a place in my life when I, I, this was literally my favorite Bible passage. 1 Kings 19.4. Times had gotten so rough for me that I, I would read it and I'd say, Lord, if Elijah was okay to say this, then Lord, I'm saying it. If you, if, if, I'm not suicidal, but if you, if you want me to just, if you want to take me, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go. And one of the things that happens and I've had several times in my life when I've been low, but, but, but one thing that happens is that the devil begins to play with your mind. Emotionally, he tries to lead you where he wants you. Uh, and, and I am uh, convinced as a physician that the devil is working overtime now to get people to a place of extreme hopelessness. Now, this may seem like a strange topic on Mother's Day, but let me tell you something. I lost my mother early. Mother's Day is, is difficult for me because of that. When I lost my mother, I've, t I've told a story before, there was a sense of hopelessness that if this woman of God could not be healed from what ailed her, what hope do I have? There was a, a bit of despair that took over. And, and I want to submit to you on this Mother's Day weekend that hope must come from that which is eternal. For this reason, in America now, more than 47,500 people died in 2019 of suicide. That was one person every 11 minutes. Hopelessness has grabbed hold of the world. In fact, it's worse than that. Uh, many adults think about suicide or attempt suicide. The, the, I, you, I could go through all of these, but what scared me is this last one. 1.4 million who attempted suicide that year. That, those are staggering, staggering numbers of people who are more afraid of facing life than they are of facing death. 
told you the story even of my little cousin who, who committed suicide. Let me tell you, there is no, there's nothing that can heal that kind of pain. Because you're left with so many questions and so many times you run through your head, what could I have done differently? In fact, you can wind up like Elijah under the juniper tree if you allow when life goes sideways to pull you in. You can wind up there quickly wondering and asking God how you got there. Some great quotes on suicide. Suicide doesn't end the chances of life getting worse. It eliminates the possibility of it ever getting any better. The person who completes suicide dies once. Those left behind die a thousand deaths, trying to relive those terrible moments and understand why. Another one that I, I, when I've had to talk to patients in this situation, I use is this one. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And where is all of this coming from? We know that in the last days, things are going to get hectic. Things are going to get difficult. In fact, depression is on the rise. More than 1 in 20 Americans age 12 and over have depression, 12 years old and older. One in seven poor Americans have depression. Rates of depression were higher in 40 to 59-year-olds, women, and non-Hispanic black persons than in any other demographic. Anxiety is also on the rise. A feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Anxiety disorder, disorders are the most common mental illnesses in the United States, affecting 40 million adults in the United States, 18 and older. Almost one out of five Americans uh, that are adults suffer from anxiety. And I see it all the time in my practice. It is one of the most common things I see in the urgent care setting, anxiousness, to the point where people's heart rates go super high. Yesterday, someone, a good friend of mine, was in the hospital, hooked up to, the, to all of the cardiac monitors with a heart rate over 140, with no negative, with no test positive, discharged from the hospital perfectly fine. He said it may just be anxiety. We are a people of worry. We are Elijah under the juniper tree. And there are some of you sitting here right now who are dealing with these issues. You often deal with them in silence. You, you often don't tell anyone you're suffering from it because you are looking back like Elijah on your life and you're comparing yourself to others or you're even comparing yourself to your ideal and you see all the times you failed and you can't forgive yourself and, and you can't forgive those who may have hurt you and you're left with emotions that have never been settled. left with uneasy minds. This is why 1 John 4.18 says this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The Christian is in a situation where love is the principle and love is the foundation of of your existence. For God so loved the world. Each one of us as Christians, when the, 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 the difficulties and challenges of life drop upon us, when they come for us, we must learn to, rem we, to settle back into God's love. Now, one of the big things, of course, is the stress equation. Something I talk about a lot in my, in my sermons is the impact of stress. And it's being Mother's Day, let me say, one of the most stressed people I ever knew was my mother. Mothers often have to carry the, word, the weight of not just the world, but of multiple worlds. Stress is a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. Elijah was stressed. The equation is this. Stress equals demands minus resources. Stress equals demands minus resources. 
That is the stress equation. If you understand this equation, you can better prepare yourself to deal with stress. Now, why is stress, why is it so, why is stress so dangerous? It's because it puts you into a fight or flight mode, like if you're being chased by a dog. I talk a lot about my experiences with dogs when I was a kid. I, I, to this day, I'm not a big dog person because I, I grew up in neighborhoods and, and visited neighborhoods where people didn't have, they didn't put dogs in bags and feed them little candies and stuff. Dogs in the backyard on a chain starving to death, guarding the house. If you made the mistake of coming face to face with one of those dogs, you were in trouble. But what God did is he designed it. After sin entered the world, he gave us the ability to respond um, to, the, to the challenges that the world would now give. Remember, before sin, there wasn't a ferocious dog. There wasn't a venomous snake. There was no uh, angry uh, wasp. The world was in perfect harmony. After sin, Adam and Eve had to watch thorns begin to um, erupt on the side of beautiful flowers. We were, David says, we, uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Why? Because we are made with this ability through a process called allostasis to be able to change at the blink of an eye. Cortisol is released in the brain. Adrenaline is released uh, uh, in the body. And you get this rush of stress hormones that allows you to actually be physically stronger and mentally more clear than you otherwise could be. That is your fight or flight response. And as you've heard me say before, the problem is if you feel like you're being chased by a dog all the time. If life gets so stressful that no matter what you're doing, no matter where you go, uh, you can't chase the dog. Now, and this can be real or perceived. I hope you're getting this. Because sometimes it is real. You get the wrong job with the wrong supervisor and like that dog chasing us as kids, you feel every day when you go to work, your heart rate increases, your respiratory rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your liver starts making sugar, your pancreas starts making insulin, uh, your blood is shunted away from your digestive tract to your big muscles, and you change physiologically to try and adapt to what you perceive as, as a threat. Young people, this is why it's so important that you marry the right person. Oh, y'all missing this thing. Because if you don't uh, build your life uh, in such a way that God will be pleased and stress will be uh, kept at bay. I want to tell you, it, even with the best whole food plant-based diet, stress can still kill you early. As Elijah was under the juniper tree and he was running from Jezebel, his, his stress hormone system was in overdrive. He wasn't thinking like he normally would think anymore. He was in panic mode. So he says to God, rather than stay here and be stressed, you can take my life. It causes disease. I won't go into all of this, but we now know that if two people eat the same diet, that is hamburgers and french fries, the one that is more stressed is the one that's going to develop atherosclerotic plaques and be more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. Same diet, the one that's more stressed, that's what, that's what happens. Someone is stressed, we now know that they do not make the antibodies in their mucosa of their mouth and nose to release immunoglobulin A, which that antibody's job is to catch the virus before it can get into your body. But when you're stressed, those things come down. That's why stressed out people often get a lots of colds and flus. By the time, we could even get into a bit more about how coronavirus affects that. But all of this is part of it. Depression increases and anxiety increase the production of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines. The same things that coronavirus produces are produced by depression and anxiety. When you have high levels of these, of these things, like interleukin-6, you can see from here that you, this increases the risk of arthritis, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, um, and multiple types of cancer, these uh, lympho, lymphoproliferative diseases, um, like multiple myeloma, which is what my mother died of. Stress can do all of this through interleukin-6, and then on top of that, it produces something called C-reactive protein, which is an increased risk for heart attacks. Just by being stressed. So I, I, I'll pause here to say, if something is stressing you, don't ignore it. Of course, I, I won't get into this, but 
we're, we're very worried about COVID and, and, and stress. Now that COVID virus, COVID pandemic seems to be winding down a bit, but cortisol, which you produce when you're stressed, actually stops your body um, down here. Uh, the cortisol, you get cortisol resistance, and that makes it means that your, your immune system becomes hyper-inflamed. When it becomes hyper-inflamed, those inflammatory um, uh, 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 particles and, and, and so forth cross the blood-brain barrier and actually inflame the brain. And so you get this cycle of stress, a weak immune system that can't check inflammation, and that goes back to your brain and inflames your brain even more. It becomes like a cycle. That's why the scripture gives us this promise. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you are not trusting God, if you're not relying on his Holy Spirit, if you are allowing the world to lead you into a life of stress and fear, which leads to anxiety and depression, you are not going to have a sound mind. And let me tell you why that's relevant. Because the final uh, battle, the great controversy itself, is not going to be fought um, on the battlefields of the world. It won't even be fought in the, in the cosmos of the universe. The, the great uh, controversy is ultimately fought right here in our minds. In the frontal lobe of our minds where we make decisions, this is why the Bible is, uh, Paul is trying to tell Timothy, listen, you don't have a spirit of fear. The spirit that God has given you is one of power, love, and a sound mind. Why is a sound mind so important? That's your mind is where the seal of the living God goes. You read the last chapter of the book of Revelation, it says that God is going to write his name in their foreheads. What does that mean? That means that the character, the frontal lobe, this is where your character sits, it will be just like Christ's character. Satan can steal that through fear. That's how he tripped up Eve. And even when they had recognized they were naked and they ran, what did they say to God? We were afraid. Because we were naked. Fear separates you from God. Matthew 11 and verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is not easy to turn everything over to God. We often want to hold on to it for as long as we can. In fact, many times we are pacified by our own pain. It is by rolling around and relishing our pain many times that we feel like a sense of control and a sense of completeness. We have, <laughs> pain must be let go of. The Bible says that Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness. Some of you are a day's journey into the wilderness. You're sitting under the juniper tree. And you're looking at your family situation, your, the past of your family um, uh, scars, looking at the decisions you made like Elijah. I am not, not better than my father. You're sitting there relishing, rolling, um, <laughs> completely immersed at times in what happened behind you. I, I, I came today to tell you that the God of heaven is a liberator. He will set you free from your past, from your shame, from whatever mistakes you made. Elijah failed. He felt he failed in not uh, making Israel uh, uh, come to reformation. But look at what the spirit of prophecy says. She says, Elijah failed in the very point I'm sorry, this is Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon said this. Elijah failed in the very point at which he was strongest. And that is where most men fail. In scripture, it is the wisest man who proves himself to be the greatest fool. Just as the meekest man, Moses, spoke hasty and bitter words. Abraham failed in his faith and Job in his patience. 
So he who was the most courageous, speaking of Elijah, he who was the most courageous of all men fled from an angry woman. Ellen White says this, Patri uh, Prophets and Kings, page 159, she says, Elijah should not have fled from his post of duty. He should have met the threat of Jezebel with an appeal for protection to the one who had commissioned him to vindicate the honor of Jehovah. He should have told the messenger that the God in whom he trusted would protect him against the hatred of the queen. Only a few hours had passed since he had witnessed a wonderful manifestation of divine power, and this should have given him assurance that he would not now be forsaken. Had he remained where he was, watch this, church, had he made God his refuge and strength standing steadfast for the truth, he would have been shielded from harm. The Lord would have given him another signal victory by sending his judgments on Jezebel and the impression made on the king and the people would have wrought a great reformation. Did you get that? When I used to do addiction medicine a training at Loma Linda at our veterans hospital there, one of the things that was very fascinating is that when, the, when these former addicts now in recovery, meeting at the VA hospital, we, we would have group sessions. One of the things they would say a lot is, don't give up before the miracle happens. And what they said is that many people walk away from God right when God is about to work a great miracle for them. Many people walk away from their marriage right when God was going to do something supernatural for them. They walk away in, in, uh, in trying to bring their children back to God right when God was going to do something miraculous. Elijah ran, and had he stood fast, he would have seen an even greater miracle than a fire coming down from heaven, because he would have seen Israel reformed. Into the experience of all, there come times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement, days when sorrow is the portion and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life would spring into being. I know many who had difficulties in their lives. They lost a loved one. Maybe they lost a court case they thought they would win. A marriage dissolved. Job situation didn't work out. And in that time, the stress of life causes them like Elijah to question their own existence and ultimately leads them to question their God. Satan pounces on your doubt. And when you begin to question whether or not God is a good God, Satan begins his final assault. There's no... To me, it's not a coincidence. I've been watching all these great World War I and World War II documentaries. I kind of get got caught up in them. It's just so fascinating, the history. But as I was watching them, I remember the words of a British pastor when I was speaking in England a few years back said to me, I asked him why the British Isles, once so powerful for God, such a, the center of really Christianity in the world in many ways, what happened? He said, the world wars, the destruction, the devastation, the lack of, of hope, the, the disbelief um, that men could treat men the way they did was, was like a plague. And, and surely after this, as many doubted God and thought that instead it really would take military might to keep peace, along with some other cultural shifts, people stopped believing in God. 
Let me tell you something, church. Worse than the world wars is coming. A time of trouble like the world has never seen. If you are not rooted in God, let me say it like this. If the little trials we go through now cause us to walk from God, to doubt God, to question our own existence, what happens when the big trouble comes? The Old Testament prophet says, if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let me tell you something, church, when you see that you're weak, when you see that you fail, when you recognize that you're not always where you're supposed to be with God, that is the evidence that you need him, not that he doesn't exist. When trial and life brings you to your knees, remember what Paul was told here in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Trust God in that. Ellen White says it like this. She says, for the disheartened, there is a sure remedy, faith prayer, and work. Faith and activity will impart assurance and satisfaction that will increase day by day. Are you tempted to give way to feelings of anxious foreboding or utter despondency? In the darkest days, when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not. Have faith in God. He knows your need. He has all power. His infinite love and compassion never weary. Fear not that he will fail of fulfilling his promise. I like the last part here. He, he is eternal truth. What that means is what he said 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago in his word, is still truth because he is eternal truth. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word what? Was God. Was God. His word is eternal truth. So you know what I tell patients to do? When they're struggling with some of this stuff, I tell them, I've told you guys this before, get an index card. Write a Bible promise on one side of the card and give a reason for what it is you're trying to gain victory over. Whether for, with the veterans, I used to do that with them around cigarettes, but it could be anything. And what I want to tell you is that when you're going through your day, pull out that index card and I want you to claim the promise on the card. I, I mean, I want, you to, I want you to go into work with ammunition. When Satan came at Jesus at his lowest point in the wilderness, it's not, it's not a coincidence that Elijah under the juniper tree is fed bread. And then when Jesus is in a very similar situation in a similar wilderness, that Satan comes and tempts him with bread. Jesus knew the Old Testament story of Elijah and how bread was provided. That's why Satan comes and says, listen, turn the stones into bread. Jesus' answer to him is, it is written. Church, when Satan comes to you to try and get you to turn the stones of this world into bread, respond with, it is written. Put the word of God on those index cards or find an app that will, you can use on your phone and get the word of God. And I want you to, to recite the word of God out loud. If you're at work, go in the bathroom or in a closet and call on God's name and remind him, tell him, you promised, Lord, in the book of Psalms, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Let me tell you, your spiritual walk will be transformed. When the weapon you use, remember in, 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 in um, Ephesians 6, when he talked about the, the, um, the uh, armor of God, there's only one offensive weapon, that's the sword. And the sword is the word. But many of us have never drawn our sword against the devil. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 7, as he lay, as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, because he was smart, remember the snakes don't like juniper trees. Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruse of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. 
And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched them and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. How merciful is God? He's going to get, get on Elijah in a second. But before he does, you see what he does? He lets him rest and he feeds him. God is a good God. He lets Elijah recover from everything he's been through. The emotional roller coaster the last few days have been. He lets him rest. And then God, can you imagine what that, that bread tastes like? God baked him a cake. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the, in that, in the strength of that meat. Look how long. 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted until he got to Horeb, the mount of God. He went into a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah, what are you doing here? There's no work for you to do here. Elijah's response is, verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord. God of hosts for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. God then starts to speak to him like he's speaking to us. 1 Kings 19, 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind rent the mountains. The mountains, as, as Elijah standing there, the mountains begin to break from the wind. And the Bible says, then break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But here's the key part. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And I, I take this, and what I get from it is, Elijah saw fire come down from heaven and thought that was the end-all, be-all. But it takes for you to hear God whispering in your ear. Sometimes we as Christians are looking for fire to come down and earthquakes to happen. But I'm going to tell you the most powerful way that God moves is with a still, small voice just whispering in your ear. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of, in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him. The second time God asked Elijah, what doest thou here? And I want you to get this. This is not a question of geography. This is saying, uh, Elijah, what are you doing here emotionally? What are you doing here spiritually, Elijah? Why are you hiding out in a cave far away from the work I need for you to do? Why are you here emotionally and spiritually? And he's asking some of us that. What are you doing here? Why are you so far from the purpose I have for you? And he goes back into this whole thing again. I love Elijah, boy. He, 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 uh, he, he's, like a, he's like a broken record. He just keeps saying the same thing. I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah, you wonder why I'm here? Because they're trying to kill me. And I'm the only one left. But look at God's response. This is his response to us as well. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nish Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abelmalah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And God said, Not only are you not the only one that hasn't bowed his knee, I've got your replacement lined up. And it shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. God says, listen, I have, I'm going to reap my judgment just as I said I would. But I can't do it if you're hiding in a cave. And then God really rebukes him with this line. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel all the knees of which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. You're not alone. 
There are others who are faithful, Elijah. And some of us need to realize whatever you're going through in this life, whatever difficulties you're facing, whatever challenges you have, you're not alone. God has others that he is supporting and keeping. And if you'll connect with them, God can give you a, a support group right here on earth. And it's called the church. Ellen White and Prophets and Kings, page 174, says, Those who, while spending their life energies in self-sacrificing labor, are tempted to give way to despondency and distrust. Many gather courage from the experience of Elijah. May gather courage from the experience of Elijah. God's watchful care, his love, his power, are especially manifest in behalf of his servants whose zeal is misunderstood or unappreciated, whose counsels and reproofs are slighted, and whose efforts toward reform are repaid with hatred and opposition. So powerful was Elijah. And even after we see his failure, this is what James says about him in the New Testament. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. James is trying to tell you, Elijah was not perfect. He messed up. But even when he prayed, God moved. That's a statement that you need to pray and watch God move. Because there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that fears is not made perfect in love. What are you afraid of? Is Jezebel chasing you? You feel all alone, forsaken? God's love is a perfect love. I started off by saying that one of the first safe places we experience in this life is with our mother. When I was with my mother, I felt completely safe as a child. And probably most kids have that experience. Unfortunately, not all. But I want to submit to you that God's love for you dwarfs your mother's love for you. It dwarfs it. So if I could feel safe with my mother, and even as an adult, let me tell you something. My mother was just as critical to me in medical school as she was when I was in, uh, when I was in medical school, just like she was when I was in preschool. And, and, and all of that love, all of the guidance, all of the wisdom she shared with me, the acceptance of, 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 continued acceptance of me, even when I failed and messed up, it is astronomically higher the way God loves us. That's why John is saying here, you don't have to fear. Spirit of Prophecy says this, Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. To finish the story, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, we fast forward. Elijah, who prayed that God would take his life, never sees death. Isn't that powerful? He never dies. Like I said last time, he gets that Holy Ghost Uber. Verse 11, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. The final analysis, Elijah never sees death. And if we can overcome, we will have that same ending. Revelation 2.7 says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 22 and verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I don't know what you're going through this Mother's Day weekend, but I want to submit to you that God has the ability to make you an overcomer, to give you victory in your life, even in the points of your life where you are at your weakest. That is the God that we serve. And all the devil's armies, all of his minions 
cannot touch one hair on your head unless God allows it. And if he allows it, it's because he knows with his strength you can handle it. So don't be afraid. Be strong. Understand that God has your back. He's about to return. These chariots that Elijah went up in, the chariots are coming, church. Soon and very soon, this world is going to come to a close. You can see it on the nightly news. This world can't go on much longer. This is not a time for fear. This is a time for faith. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. When, I laid, when they laid my mother in her tomb, I stood there and I prayed to God that he would mark the spot that the angels would come and collect my mother one day. And it was as if the Spirit of God impressed upon me that it's not he who would forget. It's me who would forget. And one day I plan to see my mother again, church. I have that expectation on this Mother's Day weekend that one day chariots will come. And by the grace of Almighty God, I'll be taken up like Elijah and reunited with my mother. But it will not happen if I live this life in fear. I've got to trust the God who my mother trusted. By God's grace, church, I pray each of us this week would trust God evermore. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study the story of Elijah, your servant. Lord, when crisis hit, he ran. He hid. He even left his servant, Lord. But Lord, even in his cowardice, you encouraged him. Even in his weakness, you gave him rest and bread. Even in his isolation, you visited him in the cave and whispered in his ear. That tells us, Lord, that no matter how long we've been running from you, you'll still meet us under the juniper tree. It tells us, Lord, that no matter how deeply isolated we are in the cave, that you'll still whisper to us. And Father God, the same way that you gave Elijah instruction, you've given us instruction. I pray that each one of us would be faithful and not fear. That we'd be courageous and not cowards. And Father God, we would stand for you even when the rest of the world bows to sin. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 432, Shall We Gather at the River? 432, please stand.
thanks for the benediction. Father God, we thank you for the story of Elijah. It tells us that even when we have lost hope, we have not lost you. There's some, Lord, today who are under the juniper tree, some in the cave. Father God, visit them this week. Get them back where they ought to be, Lord. And remind us again all week that the chariots are coming. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to that end is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.